right, Psalm 23 is where we're going to look tonight. Um, and tonight will be our last night in the Psalms for a little while. Um, I didn't intend to st spend too long there. Um, we, we had looked last week at Psalm 37, and I, I, I guess I had deliberately skipped over the 23rd Psalm. I, I guess because it's a bit familiar. But we'll let... Uh, We'll let that go. Um, but look, Psalm 23 is, I, I think if you, if you talk to people and they say, what's your favourite psalm or perhaps the most familiar psalm? I, I think Psalm 23 is probably one of the ones that uh, most people would mention as a psalm that they're familiar with uh, or at least they, they have heard before. But when you look at Psalm 23, it has been a source of comfort for, for millions of Christians through the centuries. And I, I think in this most precious of psalms, um, David looks at the Lord as his shepherd. And I, I think that it's a very personal psalm of praise and thanks to God. And David in this psalm is acknowledging God's goodness to him. And he teaches us some really important principles for living that are, are there. Um, and now when you look at Psalm 23, I think we've talked about this before, but in Psalm uh, 23, it actually forms uh, where it sits in the Psalms. It's in between Psalm uh, 22 and Psalm 24, obviously. Genius here, I, I'm, I'm not too bad at counting. Uh, but when you look at Psalm number 22, Psalm 22 speaks about Christ in his suffering. And uh, Schofield actually points out there that Psalm 22, 23 and 24 form a trilogy. So in Psalm 22, you see Christ as the, the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. Uh, in Psalm 23, we see Christ as the great shepherd who is risen again from the dead and he sanctifies us and he, he, uh, he, he shepherds us, if you will. And then in Psalm 24, it's a psalm of the return of Christ. It starts out, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And I think uh, Spurgeon made the point in his uh, commentary on the Psalms that Psalm 23 only comes about as a result of what occurred in Psalm 22, which is, uh, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me as Christ spoke on the cross there? Um, but let's have a look then at Psalm 23. We'll, we'll read it through. It's quite a short psalm. You may not even uh, need your Bible. Perhaps you've uh, committed it to memory. But let's have a look. And I'll just read and you can follow on for the benefit of the recording. Um, but Psalm 23, and we'll read now. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Uh, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And let's pray. Father in heaven, we're thankful for this uh, psalm. We're thankful for the life of David and the lessons we can learn through it. Um, but also, Lord, we're grateful um, that we can see past David and we can see Jesus Christ in the psalms. We pray that you'd help us uh, tonight that we would uh, pay close attention to what you have for us. And maybe, uh, Lord, there's someone here tonight that has a special need that you'd meet that in the person of Christ through your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, psalm 23. So, um, as I said, this psalm was written by David and it was probably written towards the end of his life as he's looking back. Um, some have said while he was young. I, I don't know. It doesn't actually indicate there in the psalm when it was written. But let's have a look through. And I think there's like nine or ten principles. What do we got? Eleven. Sorry, eleven principles. I should have, uh, should have written it up the top there. How many there were? Let's have a look. Number one, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. The first principle tonight we see is the principle of ownership. The principle of ownership. The Lord is my shepherd. In Psalm 100, Verse number three, David wrote this, Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Go forward again to Psalm 95, if you would. Stick a bookmark in Psalm 23. We'll uh, be, be jumping back there quite regularly. But in Psalm 95, which is, I, I guess, a, a, a psalm that was written about the children of Israel uh, in the wilderness, um, you can read what he says here in verse number six. It says, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. 
Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me and saw my work. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, it is a people that do err in their heart and they have not known my ways, under whom I swore in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. Now again there, that's speaking about the Jews in the wilderness. Um, but the point that the psalmist is making there is that, uh, that God, by redeeming the people of Israel out of Egypt, he brought them unto himself and became their shepherd. Now, that's a very good picture of what the Lord does for us. He redeems us out of the slave market of sin. So when David here is writing, the Lord is my shepherd, he speaks about the ownership of the shepherd and the sheep and also the sheep of the shepherd. Uh, in, in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes, What know you not that your temple, uh, so your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You see, we belong to God. Now, that doesn't sound the best to belong to someone, does it? You know, we belong to someone else and we like to think of ourselves as quite independent. Um, but we belong to God. It's not a bad thing, though. He's a good master. Uh, Matthew 11, verse 28 through 30, it says, Come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light uh, now when you read through the book of Romans you see that there's a very clear picture that when we are unsaved we are servants of sin but when we get saved we, we become servants of God we become his servants and we should live as such so the first principle that David has there is the principle of ownership and it's a, it's a very good thing to belong to God because God looks after his own which is a, a very important lesson and this is uh, what this psalm really covers off on so let's have a look then at the next little uh, the next little phrase he says the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want I shall not want we see here the principle of provision the, the Hebrew word here for want means to lack the Lord is my shepherd I shall not lack I'm not going to want anything because the Lord is the one who supplies my needs. Um, God supplies our needs. Does anyone doubt that for a moment? I like talking to Xander about stuff. You know, I've got it in Xander's head that God has made everything. And that's a good thing. You know, I said, Xander, where does the rain come from? The clouds. Who made the clouds? God. God. OK, that's good. You know, where did tomatoes come from? God, you know, so everything, the answer is God. And I'm like, that's a good thing. You know, they come from a tree and God makes them grow. But God uh, takes care of our wants. He, he uh, gives us our provision. Um, he supplies our needs physically. The psalmist wrote again, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. O fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. So the Lord takes care of our needs physically. But if you go forward to 2 Peter chapter 1, also the Lord takes care of all our needs spiritually as well. And uh, it comes through the knowledge of Christ, through his word, and also through our, uh, our, our lives in him as, as we grow in him. But in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, we see here that, uh, well, we'll read verse 1 down to verse 3. Simon Peter, a servant of and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Saviour Jesus Christ grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord and then look at this next verse here according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. So you see there in that verse that uh, by knowing Christ in salvation and growing in him, God has given us all things that we need in life for life and godliness. You say, well, isn't there stuff outside the Bible we can learn? Yes, there is. But there's nothing that is, I'll get over it. Uh, there's nothing outside of the scriptures that we need for our lives that we can live a life of godliness that is pleasing in his sight. Now, I, I like reading lots of books. I don't think that we should just limit ourselves to, to one book. I, I read the Bible. I also read uh, lots of other books. I like reading biographies. I like reading how-to books. I, I like lots of books. Um, but if every book in the world was stripped away and we were left with the word of God only, we would have everything we need to live a godly life. Um, and that's I don't know, that's just what it says. It says that we've been given all things that we need for a life of God, a life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory 
and virtue. You see, the shepherd supplies our needs. Um, and we live in a society, though, that would have us discontented. You ever notice that? Uh, have you ever gone to the shops? And uh, I, I hate fashion. As you look at me and say, I can tell, you know. But I, I'm not into fashion, you know. Sometimes you see fashions and they, they come and go. I, I think you should look decent. I don't think you should look like a, a, a dag. Um, although, if you see me most of the time, you'll go, wow, he doesn't practice what he preaches. Uh, but no, I, I don't think we should go out of our way to look bad. Um, but you look at some of the new fashions. Have you seen those pants where uh, I, I think the crotch of the pants is somewhere around the knee? Have you seen those? Like, they just look stupid, you know. And... Uh, but every, every, uh, every year a new fashion comes out and you need to buy new clothes and I know it keeps Rods in a job so I won't preach again. No, but it, uh, it, you don't, the, the world constantly tells you you need new stuff, you need a new house, you need a new car, you need new clothes, you need new this, you need new that, you need to upgrade your, your wife. Oh no, you need, to, you, know, you need to update to something better so that you can be happy because you're obviously unhappy with uh, you know, what you've got at the moment. And you watch TV if there's an ad that comes on There'll be someone there and, you know, a good looking man and he'll have this shiny watch. You see, mine's a very nice watch. Uh, it's a, you know, G-Shock, 120 bucks. I think my grandma bought it for me. Um, but, you know, you know, they'll have this shiny watch and you'll look at it and you're like, wow, if I had a nice watch like that guy, I'd probably have that many good looking women around me too, you know? Um, and <laughs> it's, uh, I don't know, you know, but the world would seek to tell us that we, we should be discontented with what we have. But when we have the Lord as our shepherd, we shall not want, we shall not lack. And, uh, and, and this leads to great contentment when we pause and realise the wealth that we have in Christ. Uh, Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. You see, this principle of provision, it means that when we have the shepherd, we shall not want, we shall not have lack in our life. Um, God promises to meet our needs. He meets them physically and spiritually in Jesus Christ. And, uh, and having the Lord as our shepherd is a very, very uh, good thing. For that reason, I shall not want. Um, now let's continue on. So we saw the principle of ownership, now the principle of provision. The third principle we see is the principle of guidance for peaceful living. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Now, guidance for peaceful living. Who here likes peaceful living? I like living in peace. <laughs> uh, I like... I don't like violence very much. Uh, you know, sometimes we watch it on TV uh, and our society is full of violence, you know, and uh, you watch movies will come out and they say, oh, it's the most violent movie. And you're like, oh, OK, I'm probably going to give that one a miss. But uh, you need to um, we need to appreciate peaceful living. And in Australia, we we uh, don't really have the, the threat or the fear of war, which is a good thing. But the Bible teaches um, that in our lives, sometimes we can have inner turmoil. And, uh, and yet the shepherd here supplies our needs by giving us guidance for peaceful living. Look at what he says. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Now, this is a, there are two aspects there. There's the green pastures and the still waters. Now, uh, apparently I was reading and now I'm not a shepherd guy. I don't know much about sheep. But apparently sheep don't lie down unless they've had their fill of food. That, that's just what I've read. And so what the shepherd is saying here is that the Lord supplies our needs there in a peaceful fashion, but also he leads us beside the still water. So there's the aspect where the Lord makes us to lie down, but then he leads us along. And uh, someone has said that the green pastures remind us of the word of God, the scriptures of truth, and the, uh, the still waters remind us of the Holy Spirit. I'm not sure, but I, I don't think it's a bad application. Um, but you see that the Lord, he leads us and he makes us to lie down. And uh, if we are going to carry that application across of the, the green pastures being the word of God, we can see that we need the Lord to help us to understand these things. And the Lord wants to lead us to live a certain way. Did you know that? The Lord would have us to live a certain way. There is a broad uh, outline of how he wants us to live. Now, not everyone needs to be the same. Not everyone needs to, um, you know do homeschooling, then go to Bible college, then be a pastor or a missionary. That, that's, I'm not talking like that. But the Lord has a framework within which he would have us to live. And we'll look at that in a moment as we get later on. Um, but the Lord has given us certain things that he wants for everyone. And there's actually a good chapter in the Answers book. I'll give you a plug here on uh, things that every Christian should do. Have you, have you read that one, Pastor? Yeah, it's a good one. You know, and it's uh, one of them is it is the will of God that everyone gets saved. You know, you must get saved. You must be born again. It's, I think it's based on the word must, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, can't, I was reading it a little while ago. But 
there's a lot of things. It's the will of God for everyone that we all abstain from fornication. And, and you can look at that. This is the will of God. And there's, there's thing, things that for everyone, regardless of whether you're a man, a woman, a boy, a girl, it's the will of God for everyone that these things happen in your life. And I, so I can't remember all of them. Uh, but it's a chapter in the answers book. So when you get home, you can have a read of it. Um, so God has that broad way of how he wants us to live. But then also he guides us in his word through the, the spirit of God, because the spirit of God, when we get saved, comes and lives inside of us. Uh, and he teaches us his word so that we can be led beside the still waters. And uh, in, in Corinthians, Paul wrote that the natural man receives not the things of God for their foolishness under him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And, and in John, Jesus wrote that uh, the spirit of truth, when he is come, he will guide us into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear that shall he speak and he will show you things to come. And uh, so God, as I said, he wants to le lead us in a certain way. And you, you notice there that the shepherd is not directing, but he's leading. And uh, the Lord left us an example and Peter wrote about it that we should follow in his steps. So I guess, as I said, I wasn't quite sure what to name this principle, the principle for godly, peaceful living. And, uh, and that's where we can see there. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Let's crack on then. Let's see principle number four, the principle of restoration. The principle of restoration. Anyone ever have a season in your life where you're weary? <laughs> sometimes we, uh, we all look, sometimes we all feel like pastor looks, you know. No, we, uh, sometimes we get tired. Sometimes we get weary. Sometimes you go, oh man, I can't believe I'm, you know. You know, you, you, you listen to older people talk. And I, I'm a younger person. I don't think there's actually that many people here younger than me. Uh, there's maybe a couple. Uh, but, you know, you hear older people talk and they talk about how draining life is. I'm like, gee, I'm not even 30 yet and I'm already drained. Imagine what I'm going to be like when I'm 60. I'm going to just be constantly sleeping or something, you know, on the couch. I don't think I'll have little kids running around then though, so maybe that'll be better. But, or maybe I'll have invented a stronger form of uh, stimulant like Coke, or Coke Plus and they'll have like 10 times the caffeine to keep you going all day long. But... Uh, <laughs> But, no, but, but sometimes we get weary in life and our souls need restoring. See, when our soul is sorrowful, God revives it. Uh, when our soul is sinful, he sanctifies it. Uh, when we are weak, he strengthens us. And there's many, many examples through the Bible of men and women who were weak in themselves. You, you know, Elijah. And Elijah, I like Elijah. You know why I like Elijah? Because he's just a little bit like us, you know, and he's there and uh, he had a great victory one. You, you remember the story where he's up on Mount Carmel and, you know, it's been a terrible time for Israel. They've got King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. Everything's going a little bit pear-shaped and he goes, all right, it's not going to rain. And it didn't rain and God supplied his needs. You know, where was he? He was in uh, by the brook Cherith. And, uh, and, there, and, and he had the water there and he had some, uh, some, some bread come and then the water dried up. So he got up and, and he went into Zarephath and there was a widow there that God had commanded to sustain him. But the widow hadn't got the memo yet. <laughs> you, you remember that? He, he said, I've commanded a widow woman there to sustain you. You remember that? And then he walks in, the widow didn't know anything about it. And, uh, and he goes uh, and, and he sees this widow woman and she's collecting her last stick, you know, some sticks. And she go, he goes, hey. How are you? She goes, oh, yeah, good, good. Hey, I want you to make me some food. She goes, well, actually, no, I can't. I'm sorry. Um, I'm making, uh, I'm collecting some wood. I've got enough food for my son and I to eat one more time and then we're going to die. Terrible, you know. But he goes, no, no, make it for me first and the cruise of oil shall not fail. By the way, that's the same word that uh, I shall not want is the same word there for fail. Anyway, um, by the by. But we, uh, we see there that uh, Elijah had his needs miraculously met for three and a half years. And then he goes before Ahab and says to Ahab, mate, we're going to have a competition. Mount Carmel, be there. Bring all your prophets. It's going to be good. We're going to see who the God of Israel is. Anyway, so they had all the prophets of Baal. Uh, how many prophets they had? Do you remember? I think there was a thousand in total when you add them all up, all the different uh, sects that were there. You had 700 and 300 and, and a few different other people there. And all the people of Israel came together and there was one prophet of God that stood up and the prophet of God uh, said, well, you guys go first. And they build an altar there and they put the cow on it and they say, let's see who's going to answer by fire. And so the, the priests of Baal are dancing around, cutting themselves, uh, crying, oh, Baal, hear us, oh, Baal, hear us. And Elijah's there mocking them. He says, well, maybe, maybe your God's asleep. Maybe it's this and that. No, uh, one of the modern versions says maybe Baal is on the toilet, which uh, is not in the Hebrew at all, uh, but, which is, a, I think, a silly way to translate it. Um, but it's sort of, 
I, I guess it gives the idea of what Elijah was having a go at him about. You know, he's really mocking him there. And so they all finish up and Elijah, about the time of the evening sacrifice, so they've been going all day and Elijah's just sitting there watching and he rebuilds this altar on Mount Carmel and he takes the, uh, takes the animal and lays it on. He says, now guys, go down to the water and get the, the barrels of water and pour them on. I think there was seven barrels. Was it seven barrels? Anyway, I'm, I can't remember how many, but there was a lot of barrels. They poured it on just to make sure, you know, it was thoroughly drenched. And he stood there and he prayed and the Lord answered by fire. And the Lord uh, consumed that and consumed the dust around it. It burnt the whole thing up. And everyone that was there saw it and said, the Lord, he is God. And they took all those prophets, the evil false prophets of Baal, and they killed them that day. Wow, what a victory. Isn't that good? Where's Elijah in the next chapter? He's under a juniper tree saying, Lord, it's enough. Kill me. Uh, you know, Jezebel said, I'm going to kill you now, Elijah. And Elijah, who for the last three and a half years has eaten directly from the hand of God, uh, from the, the ravens and drinking from a brook and then from a widow woman who didn't have enough food for herself. And yet somehow the Lord made it so the barrel didn't fail. Um, and now he's just seen the Lord destroy and a sacrifice, uh, obliterate it by fire. Here he is under a juniper tree saying, Lord, it's enough. Take away my life now. I'm, I'm done. Lord, it's over. And the Lord restored him from that. And you can see many, many times through the scriptures, you see that uh, people get to the end of themselves and the Lord restores them. You see what he says there in verse, 20, uh, verse number three of Psalm 23. He restoreth my soul. Maybe you're here tonight and you're in need of restoring. Maybe you're feeling a bit weak and tired in your Christian life. Maybe you're, everything else is going fine, but your faith is weak. Um, tonight, the Lord is able to restore your soul. We see the principle of restoration. Uh, maybe you're physically weak and the Lord can restore you there as well. So, uh, so let's see, that's number four, the principle of restoration, what our shepherd does for us. Now let's see here, we saw the principle of guidance for peaceful living. In verse number three, the end, the end part of verse three, we see guidance for godly living. Now, those two are very much, I think, intertwined. Uh, when you live godly, um, we have peace. But let's have a look here. Verse number three, it says, He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now, the paths of righteousness, it doesn't say the path, the path. Now, the scripture has many, many things we should do. Uh, as I said, there's 12 in the answers book, list of things that's God's will for everyone. Um, but there are paths of righteousness. We need to be careful that we take the whole scripture, the whole counsel of God. We don't just cherry pick. You ever known people that cherry pick the Bible? Yeah, you ever seen that? They, they're really big on one issue. They're big on uh, whatever it is, you know, like, uh, they're, they're very big on... Uh, health food. Now, this is not about choir here, but some people in the Bible, they, and they, they, they move it beyond you should eat health food to if you eat unhealthy food, you're a bad Christian, you know, and in a way, you know what, they may be a little bit right, but they make it a big spiritual requirement and they're just like, they know every verse, you know, they go, oh, you see there, the Bible says you shouldn't eat prawns, the Bible says you shouldn't eat bacon, these people should get, get their hence, you know, no, but, uh, but, but they just focus on one aspect. The Bible is a very large book with many, many things in it. And the paths of righteousness, I think, speaks about the whole counsel of God. We must be careful to take the whole scripture and not go for a smorgasbord. Anyone here like smorgasbords? I like smorgasbords. Um, sometimes anyone walk out of a smorgasbord, all you can eat place thinking, yes, I have eaten all I can eat, plus some. Yes, I'm looking at Keith. No, 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 but, uh, but no, sometimes, uh, and you know, we all do that. Now you walk out and you're like, you know what? I think I got my money's worth. I, th I think we all try that at times, don't we? When you go to an all-you-can-eat place, it depends on how much it costs as well. You know, you're like, okay, this thing's costing me 20 bucks. Okay, I need to have, if each plate of food is, you know, or if I have five plates of food that's $4 a plate, I'm getting a good deal then. So, you know, you, you pile it up and then you've got to get dessert as well. But, uh, but the, the Christian life's not a smorgasbord. When you go for a smorgasbord, you can pick up a spring roll, but you leave the dim sim and then there's some chips. So you get the chips, but you leave the chicken nuggets. And then uh, I'm, I'm thinking now through the workers club uh, thing, you know, and there's the five roast meats. You don't need to take all the roast meats. You take what you want and you leave what you don't. That's not how the Bible works. That's not that you don't just pick and choose which doctrines you like in the Bible. You, you can't just do that. You can't say, well, I'm in favor of the, uh, the whole children obeying your parents thing if you're the dad, but I'm not really in favor of husbands love your wives as Christ also loved the church. You, you, you've got to take the whole thing. Otherwise, you're not doing the whole paths of righteousness. So anyway, that's, uh, 
That's just by the by there, though. OK, but the paths of righteousness. You see, though, the doctrine of sanctification is clearly taught in the scriptures. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Um, God saved us so that we might be holy people. Um, First Peter chapter two, verse nine through 11. Peter wrote this, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. As you read through that passage there, uh, Paul, uh, sorry, Peter says, you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, and, uh, and you're to abstain from fleshly lusts. Paul, uh, sorry, Peter, writing to these people, he was writing to primarily Jewish people. Peter was the apostle to the Jews. When he said you're a royal priesthood, the Jews knew what he meant. Uh, I'm reading through the, uh, the Pentateuch at the moment, the first five books of the Bible, and we're just getting into the tabernacle being built. But when you read through the book of Leviticus, you ever got there and you're like, oh, Lord, I'm glad I'm not a Hebrew priest. Uh, there are a lot of requirements there. there. There's a lot of things. And some of them, I look at it and go, oh, really? I don't, I don't know why that would be a problem. But the Lord put them in there and he said, this is what you've got to be to be a priest. And so they're looking at it going, OK, there's a lot of rules there. And, uh, and when he talks to these people and he says, you are a royal priesthood, he's not saying you need to make sure you're not a dwarf and have a broken foot and make sure you, you know, everything's all intact. What he's saying is there are some certain things that God has called us to be, a holy nation. I like the word peculiar people. Uh, sometimes Christians take that peculiar a little too far and uh, they're just weird. But no, but we're not called to be weird, but we're called to be peculiar, different from the world. We're called to abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. And he leads us in these paths of righteousness for his name's sake, that we might glorify his holy name. Look, perhaps today you're not walking in the paths of righteousness. Maybe you never started. Maybe uh, you haven't grown that, you know, but the Lord would have us to follow him into the paths of righteousness because that's the way in which he is leading. Follow the shepherd onto the righteous path. Anyway, that's uh, point number uh, five, uh, the principle of guidance for godly living. Let's continue on. Principle number six is the principle of protection from fear and evil. All right, verse number four, it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You, you notice here um, the change of the pronoun. David, so far, when he's talking about the shepherd, how does he refer to the shepherd? He. He maketh me to lie down. He leadeth me. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me. Then he says this, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. So it moves from saying he is with me to being very, very personal, saying the shepherd is here and I'm talking to him now. Um, you see, we all go through difficult times in our life. Sometimes we have them, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we're on the mountain or the plateau or whatever you want to say and we're, we're doing well and things are going well, but then a time will come when there is a problem, uh, a sickness, uh, a, a death in the family, whatever it might be. And, uh, and maybe it's a, a, a sickness of our own or maybe it's someone else but the shepherd walks with us. You see there, it moves from talking about the shepherd to talking to the shepherd because the shepherd is nearby. Uh, the shepherd is there with us in our trouble. You see, the Christian life is not intended to be all fun and games. Uh, David teaches us here that sometimes we will walk through a valley and, uh, and the difference that a Christian has from a non-Christian is that the shepherd walks with us and we're aware of the shepherd's presence. Um, you see, and there's many good illustrations of this. I think um, in Genesis chapter 7, verse 1, when Noah has built the ark, and there he is. Uh, they've worked for 120 years, and God says to Noah, go into the ark. No, he didn't. He said, come into the ark. Come into the ark. Come. And, and what he's saying is, I'm in the ark with you. Come. And he came in and the Lord shut the door behind him and, uh, and sealed him off. Now, Noah then went through, uh, well, the world went through probably the most traumatic time it's ever been through. You know, like destruction of everyone on the world except for this bloke and his family in a boat and, and the animals that were with him. And yet God was in there with Noah protecting him. And, uh, and so God was there with him. At, at the first Passover in Exodus chapter 12, I was reading it this week, um, God said that when they applied the blood, that the Lord would pass through. And then the Bible says that he would 
pass over their house and not suffer the, the angel to come in. So the picture there is not that the Lord would go by them, but rather that the Lord would pass over them and not suffer the destroyer to come in. Uh, in uh, Exodus 12, verse 23. And you see, so for the Christian, when we are in Christ, we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. Uh, we now have the shepherd with us in all of our trials. And, uh, and he is with us with his rod and his staff. Now, the rod was a short club that was used to beat off animals. And the staff was the thing with the hook on the top that you see in lots of pictures used to direct the sheep. And the Lord uses these things in our lives, uh, sometimes the rod, sometimes the staff. Um, but he uses his word to keep us on track and to protect us. So I guess the lesson we can take is perhaps tonight there is a trial in your life or maybe it's coming. Maybe you've just come through it, but we can take uh, comfort and assurance that the shepherd is with us and we can trust him and ask him for protection. And, uh, and rather than talking about the Lord, talk to the Lord. That's what David did there in his, in his trial. Okay, let's continue on. Principle number seven. Uh, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. I, I put down this one as a principle of safety. The principle of safety. Now the illustration David uses here, thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. There's a funny YouTube clip. If I had the screen up and I'd put the time in for it, it's quite funny. It's a British Royal Marine and he says, well right, today guys we're going to be talking about the Royal Marine officer's ration pack. And he's got a ration pack sitting on a table. It's a very funny clip. If you look it up, I can't remember, I, I'm fairly confident there's no swearing in it, but uh, if you look it up and go, oh, this is terrible, I didn't remember that part. But anyway, and the guy's there and he's got this ration pack. And if you've ever seen an army ration pack, they're probably about this big, maybe a, give or take a little bit, but about that size and probably about that thick. And, uh, and this guy's got this ration pack sitting there, goes, this is the officer's one. And he reaches in and he pulls out a whole line of sausages and then he pulls out a newspaper and he pulls out, and he's got like a hole under the table and, and he, he's laying it all out. And, uh, and he goes, because officers like to read their newspaper, and then he pulls out a coffee machine. All these things just keep coming out. And it's obviously a dig at how the officers live, you know, how, how much better officers are than the enlisted men and, and you know, and, and how snooty they are. Um, but it, it's a funny thing, you know, because you look at it, and a ration pack, though, is intended to be eaten uh, very quickly. Uh, in fact, if you look at it, I was going to bring one tonight, but I, I didn't have one at home. I, I have one in the army. But most of the stuff, you can rip the lid off and suck it down in about five seconds if you wanted to. You know, the, the food is put in what they call boiler bags. And uh, so it's all pre-prepared. If you want it hot, you boil it. If you don't have time, you just rip it off and suck it down. And as I said, it's, uh, it's a little bit greasy when you do it that way. It's much better hot. Uh, but ration packs are not intended to be gourmet food. Because when, when you're in the midst of your enemy, you're not thinking, boy, I'm hungry. You know, you're thinking, oh, I hope I don't die. And, uh, and so if you need some food, you get it in quickly. But you see the picture here that David gives. He said that there is a table prepared in the midst of the enemies. And so it's almost like the Lord is there and he's got a tablecloth and he puts it down and the enemies are all around. And yet there he is and he, he goes, there's your croissant, sir. And he's prepared a nice table. There, there's not a hint of worry. There's not a hint of fear. It's because the Lord is encamped around them. And there's a verse in the Bible that the angel of the Lord is encamped around about them that fear him. And uh, you can see many times in the scriptures that the battle is the Lord's. And what he says is that he is perfectly able to keep us safe from harm. And, uh, and God says that when he is with us, and, and again, I, I suppose it's sort of like the valley of the shadow of death, where that might be talking more about circumstances. This is talking more about people and the Lord is able to to deliver us from that. So thou prepare us to table the principle of safety. Let's go, and uh, principle number eight we see tonight is the principle of direction. The principle of direction. Now we see in, uh, in verse number five, it says, thou anointest my head with oil. Thou anointest my head with oil. In the Bible, why did people anoint people? What was the point? Yeah, it was a task. Uh, perhaps it was uh, for the sheep, it was to, uh, you know, to, to keep all the flies away. But anointing generally had to do with a couple of different kinds of people. Kings got anointed for the, their, their job. David, you remember, David got anointed. Um, who else got anointed in the Bible? Jesus got anointed. Well, the priest got anointed. So uh, the priest would be anointed and there's a whole ceremony that they had and there was blood and oil and it, was, it would have been pretty messy getting anointed as a priest. And I'm kind of glad we uh, don't. No one would want to have ordination ceremonies if you're putting blood on your ear and you, you know, all these things when you read it through. Um, but no, but when the priests were um, 
allocated to their job when they reached the right age, I think it was 30, um, they would be anointed with oil. And uh, what we can see as Christians, though, we too have been anointed for a special task. We have been given purpose in life. And this, I guess, we could call the principle of direction and purpose. See, God gives us purpose in our life and gives us direction because we're on our way to heaven, because we know the truth about God. We therefore have purpose and direction and the Lord has anointed our head with oil. Uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2, we already read it, but it says, Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Anyway, we'll continue on. Uh, principle number nine tonight we're going to see is the principle of abundance. The principle of abundance. My cup runneth over. My cup runneth over. See, when we're in Christ, we have all that we need plus more. We have all that we need plus more. A cup that's running over is, uh, is one that's full to overflowing. Uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, uh, Paul wrote, But godliness with contentment is great gain. But in Christ we have unspeakable riches. Uh, we have joy unspeakable. It, when you read through the, uh, the epistles, do you ever see the, the superlatives that Paul uses? And he talks about joy unspeakable. He talks about exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. He says that we have all things in Christ. And when we consider the riches that we have in him, we see this principle of abundance. The principle of abundance means that uh, we, uh, well, actually 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, Peter wrote this, Whom having not seen, ye love, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. So he says that the joy we can have in Christ is an unspeakable joy. It's, uh, it's that joyful that you can't speak of it because it's so joyful. I, I don't quite get why it's unspeakable, but it's, it's beyond uh, what we can uh, describe with our words. Anyway, let's continue on. Uh, principle number 10 is the principle of blessing. I like this one. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Do you know what the, day, uh, what the word follow me means? Pursue. Pursue. Tim would like this. It means to hunt. It means to stalk. <laughs> I, I, anyone here have been stalked before? Ever felt like you've been stalked? Maybe you walk through the city sometimes late at night and, uh, or at Parramatta perhaps and you're walking along and you're all alone and you're like, it's a bit dark. Or you're walking through an alley, maybe at a, uh, a, uh, at a train station and you feel like someone's watching you. And uh, what this is saying is that we are being watched. We're being stalked by two things all of our lives as Christians. What is it? Goodness and mercy. They're good things to have stalking you, by the way. Uh, God is looking for ways to bless. Did you know that? I believe that. God is looking for ways to bless us. Um, the Hebrew word implies that we're being hunted by these two. And uh, like an animal being hunted by something. It's not a, you know, we don't think of it as a good thing to, to hunt something. But these, these two, goodness and mercy, are following us all the days of our life, stalking us. They're there always around the corner. And as Christians, we are blessed. We're blessed beyond all measure. And you can see in this psalm that David, time and time again, he looks back to the goodness of God and says, God is so good to me. My cup runs over. I'm filled with abundance and I am stalked by goodness and mercy. They're hunting me. Everything uh, is going my way. Now, not everything went his way in his life, that's for sure. But yet he could see God's hand of blessing behind it there. And that's the principle of blessing. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And then principle number 11, the final principle we'll see tonight is the principle of eternal life, satisfaction and joy. He said this, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, David writing this didn't live in the temple. No one, lived, the king didn't live in the temple. The king lived in the palace. Uh, the temple there was the temple for the Lord. What he was talking about was when he passed away and entered into glory, he would live in the presence of the king, of kings. Um, he would rejoice in the eternal life that God had given him. And we too can rejoice in that. In John chapter 14, verse 2, we see, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And I guess the lesson we can draw is that the Christian not only has a bright and glorious today, we have a bright and glorious tomorrow, a much brighter one. And, uh, and this is a good thing. We should learn to rejoice in that and use this as a catalyst for godly living and contentment in this life. So as you look through this uh, rather familiar of Psalms, 
Maybe you're looking at it going, well, I didn't. I, I already knew most of this psalm. But we can see that there's a, a lot of principles here we can take for godly living. What were they again? Let's, let's run through them just quickly. I got them here. Number one, the Lord is my shepherd, the principle of ownership. I shall not want, we see, the principle of provision. He makes me to lie down in green pastures and leads me beside the still waters. His principles for guidance for peaceful living. We see he restores my soul is the principle of restoration. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake is principles of godly living or guidance for godly living. Uh, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me, is the principle of protection. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies, is the principle of safety. Thou anointest my head with oil, is the principle of direction. My cup runs over, is the principle of abundance. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, is the principle of blessing. And then finally, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever, is the principle of eternal life in Christ. See, so David in this psalm, I don't know if it's a summary of the Christian life, but it certainly is a very uh, blessed psalm that we can concentrate on. And just remember that this, the blessings of this psalm all come from Christ. Um, from positionally what we saw, Psalm 22, we saw Christ giving his life as the good shepherd so that he might be our great shepherd. So let's rejoice in that tonight. And uh, if there's anything that the Lord uh, would have for you to do, let's do that this week. Let's stand and we'll pray and we'll finish there. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, that you truly are our good shepherd and our great shepherd and the chief shepherd. Uh, Lord, we pray that you'd please help us uh, this week, Lord, not to uh, not just to simply rest in that, but Lord, I pray that you'd help us to to follow your example. Lord, we pray that you would lead us and guide us and help us to be uh, obedient sheep. Help us, Lord, not to be uh, rebellious and, and go wandering off. But Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be uh, walking in the way that you'd have us to walk this week and the rest of our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, and you may be... Actually, we'll stand up. Uh, remain standing while we sing. What song have we got? The Lord is my shepherd. <laughs>